going off of on that Tony. We refer to the Molten Heritage Trust for um, the first in, um, the first public lecture uh, in a series that we're holding um, this year. As you have noticed, we have changed venue. Before we used to hold um, our public lectures at our headquarters in, in Birgu, but of course this is more central. And um, you know with with today's traffic and all that, I think you know, it, more, it makes more sense to actually hold um, these events in, in Valletta. So anyway, thank you very much for coming and um, <clears throat> let me tell you something about um, the speaker of today. David Alul set for a Diploma in Design Foundation and obtained a Bachelor's Degree in Built Environmental Studies from the University of Malta. He pursued his Master's Degree in Architecture and Urban Design, graduating as an architect in 2018. And later, he obtained his work into practice as a trade. David also has a keen interest in Malta's architectural history and in 2022, he published the book Gustav R. Vincenti, An Architectural Legacy, which was shortlisted as a finalist in the National Book Prize in 2023. And uh, I'll be reminding you later, but if you're interested, there are copies um, for sale, and I'm pretty sure that David will, uh, uh, yeah, will, 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 will sign if anyone would like to have any sign. Or perhaps if you have brought any books for him to sign, he will um, uh, oblige. You know? Right, the subject of today is, um, uh, you know, one, in my opinion, one of the greatest, um, um, you can't really call him 19th century or 20th century because he came right in between. So, but definitely um, one of Malta's modernist um, uh, architects. And um, who was a protagonist of the local art nouveau movement excelled in progressing the designs according to mainstream architectural norms, um, has pioneered Art Nouveau and Art Deco styles in Malta, who ultimately his versatility led him to shift towards modernism and experimentation with reinforced concrete, therefore bringing about a new architectural language. Um, I think one or two thank um, David for taking a particular interest in this architect because um, through his studies he has unraveled, um, uh, you know, and documented um, a great wealth of work which otherwise um, had gone um, largely undocumented. And uh, through David's efforts, as you will see today, um, uh, you know, the, the work of Gustav R. Vincenti will live on. Because, as you know, you know, a book, once it's published, you know, there's no limit because it keeps circulating. So, the knowledge about this man, thanks to David and to his study, and to his studies, um, uh, will, will live on. So, without any more cello, okay, um, I'll pass on the right to you. Thank you, Mario. Good. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Fondazione, mm -hmm. for, for organizing uh, this event. So as Mario just explained, we'll be talking about Gustav Romeo Vincenti, who was a prolific architect and also an individual within 20th century Malta. And uh, I got the opportunity to write about Vincenti um, because I personally knew his son and uh, he had given me a lot of documents that were hidden away. And probably the last person who had touched them were Gustav Vincenti himself. And through this wealth of archives and through this wealth of information, I got to know a lot of his influences, his uh, ideas, his concepts, which led to the buildings themselves that were built um, in Malta. And uh, later, in, in, uh, in my studies, my master's, master's um, um, at the university, I published my dissertation about Gustav Vincenti and all of these archive findings that I found to understand exactly what led to his architectural development. And later in my, in my profession, I published a book as well, which is now available for, for the public to understand exactly who Vincenti is, what he designed, and what were his influences that led to the buildings that are basically around us. So, who was Gustavo Romeo Vincenti? So, Gustavo Vincenti um, was born on 26 August 1888, and he was the son of Luigi Vincenti, who was a merchant, 
So we already start seeing that Vincenti was within a business-oriented family. He graduated from the University of Mota in 1910, and in 1919, he also established a firm with his brother, um, uh, Joseph Vincenti and Co., which were merchants who imported a lot of the things related to building, building materials. So, as I explained, Vincenti, as an architect, um, he also ventured into being a merchant who imported materials and, uh, and had this business acumen within his, his blood. Um, Vincenti then, later in his life, established his own firm um, by Vincenti Estates, which was a, basically a development that he started buying land, building property, selling them, and then eventually, when he had acquired a certain amount of wealth and profit in his, in his business, he also then rented out properties to, to people. Vincenti passed away on the 25th of April 1974 at the age of 85. So we start seeing that at the age of 85, Vincenti had a long lifespan. So he passed through several periods within Malta's, architect Malta's architecture and Malta's historical developments, such as the First World War, the Second World War, which we start seeing in his architecture a certain pattern which evolved through time. So Vincenti, as even Mario explained in the beginning, <coughs> He didn't just design the art and post style, but he also then ventured towards uh, modernism. As an entrepreneur himself, he started to experiment with uh, a lot of materials, new designs, and new forms, which made him a very versatile, versatile architect. Uh, Vicenti, on, on uh, 29th of April 1921, he married Maria Stella, who was the daughter of a pharmacist, um, uh, Paul Grecalou from Berkeley and on the 14th of January 1927, he had his only son, Hiller, that was born. And on a personal note, Vincenti dedicated his life to his family and also worked his life, family and work, and was a great benefactor. He was a benefactor of not just individuals, but also a lot of charitable institutions. So, but when, before we talk about exactly Vincenti and his work, it is important to understand the context that he was working in. So, during the late 19th century and the early 20th century, Malta was passing through a rapid growth in development, and uh, most of the cities and towns that we know of were being constructed, such as, such as Hamrun, and Slima, and Birkirkara, and therefore there were certain regulations that people had to abide by and this building boom that was going on in the early 20th century, the authorities had taken certain decisions that buildings had to conform with certain basic sanitary regulations. As I just explained, the 1920s and 1930s was the very um, uh, building boom in, in Mota, and uh, also areas such as Floriana in, the 19, in 1924, there was also a master plan which was proposed for the area of Floriana to be built. Unfortunately, well, or fortunately, all of this area wasn't, wasn't built, but parts of it were, were, were still constructed. And also in Valletta itself, in 1936, we start seeing the old bakeries which were demolished and also built in, uh, in a new complex known as Vincenti Buildings. In the last two points that I mentioned, Vincenti was very active in these developments, in the development of Floriana and in the development of Valletta in the old bakeries. A note that was, that was written in the Daily Malta Chronicle says that the building operations in Slima are in full swing at the moment. There is hardly no street in that popular suburb where no new house is in course of construction or an old one in repair. Maybe nowadays we can start relating to this at that time. But <laughs> at that time we can understand exactly what was the context that Vincenti was designing and building. There was also the Chamber of Architects, who had an, uh, an active role in this, this development. And uh, one main note of, of Lorenzo Gatto, who was the, the president of the Camera Peridi at the time, he said that the architect mm -hmm. is within his, his uh, responsibility, not towards himself, but also towards his country, to design in a certain manner, and to ensure that the aesthetics of building is very, is very important. And that led also with pressure from the Kamata Periti at the time for the Article 3 of the Aesthetics Building Act which regulated the aesthetics of building facades and how they would have been built. So, 
at that time, we also have to look at what was happening internationally. So what was the architectural movement that was going on? There was the Art Nouveau style, the Italian Liberty style, um, which was a new movement, which was um, a parted away from the neoclassical designs that were a replica of the previous um, classical architecture. So what were Gustavo Vincenti's architectural influences? As I mentioned, um, the international movements were a huge source of influence towards Vincenti and he himself used to go abroad and uh, see like expositions and, uh, and architectural movements that were going on internationally through his, his uh, entrepreneurial skills and even him as a merchant going abroad to deal with people that exposed him to several architectural developments that were going on internationally. These are, in the photo, you can see a number of publications which, which were in uh, Gustav Vincenti's archives, and there are much more, but they couldn't fit in one slide. And these are publications that were published um, in the early 1900s that Vincenti had purchased himself and used them as a reference for his architectural um, developments here locally in, uh, in Malta. And another book which he owned and he purchased himself was this book which was ba basically focused on modernism while the latter were focused on the art nouveau. So Vincenti himself always sought new experimentation, new architectural movements that were going on abroad so that he can reinvent his architectural, architectural uh, works. These are also four um, uh, prints that he had himself in his study, in his personal study at his home, which show this grand architecture like the Flatiron building in New York, all of them are in New York, which even himself in person, the Vincenti, always sought this grandier aesthetic towards, towards architecture and towards uh, building. So, Art Nouveau and Art, Art Deco architecture. The first project that I encountered while, while studying Vincenti was a proposed pier in the RSO, which we call the Chalet in, uh, in Malta in, the in 1912. This was a tender which was issued by the government in the early 1900s, which eventually didn't happen. But then later another architect designed the, the Chalet. But in this proposal, we start seeing that Vincenti was already um, keen into uh, designing in the Art Nouveau, Art Nouveau style. And in 1912, it was only just two years after he graduated as an architect. And we can see very close similarities to a building which was published in one of the publications that we just saw previously in the other slides, um, uh, where Vincenti started, we had to compare the main entrance with the secondary entrances on the side of the, of the pier, and that elaborate motive that Vincenti took from, uh, from this building in Turin. And uh, therefore Vincenti had already access at the time to these publications, which then eventually led to the buildings that we start seeing later in this presentation. So, Slim and St. Julian's were the main focus of uh, buildings that we see a lot of buildings in Slima designed by Vincenti and throughout this period in the Art Nouveau, in the Art Nouveau style. The first building that we start seeing is this building in Rudolf Street, um, uh, designed for uh, Dr. Giuseppe Pach, who was a well-known individual at the time, who was um, a very wealthy lawyer, who also developed land and purchased land for um, um, uh, architectural and, uh, and uh, entrepreneurial achievements. And Vincenti was an architect of his that he had commissioned to design these houses in, in Rudolf Street. On the, on the left, we see the main inspiration of Vincenti um, taken from these, these publications. But interestingly, that we can note, in these buildings, Vincenti started playing not only with the design of the building, but also with the form of the, of the built, um, uh, built dwelling. So we start seeing certain projections and, uh, and protrusions that Vincenti starts to elaborate the architecture, not in terms of just aesthetics, 
but also in terms of the form of the building, how it evolves. In these set of houses, there are about eight houses, all of them next to each other. Vincenti didn't go into the detail of the <coughs> stonework, but mainly into the aperture design and into the wrought iron railings that you see in the, in the photo and uh, on, the, on the left. So basically, in the architecture of this building is dominated mostly by the apertures and the wrought iron, the wrought iron railings. Eventually, in his designs, for example, in this case, in the English street, Vincenti starts to, to feel a bit of more context. He wanted to design buildings in the Art Nouveau style, but at the same time implement an architectural element that is found locally into, into this Art Nouveau, Art Nouveau building, which is the timber balcony. In this case, you start seeing this amalgamation of uh, of the Maltese balcony within an ornate elevation designed in the Art Nouveau style. And uh, the similarities seen from this building is also seen in one of the publications that he had. So it wasn't just a matter of seeing a motive and implementing it on a, on a building. Vincenti always <coughs> thought in a way of how to even locally give it context into a Maltese um, Art Nouveau style. And he also went into the detail of uh, designing the railings itself. So this sketch in particular was also found in his archives, which shows the proportions and the measurements exactly that he designed himself. So this wasn't found in a publication of that he had, but he designed it himself, which was eventually um, used into the elevation of this, of this building. Here we see another set of, of dwellings in Amory Street, corner with Howard Street, and, uh, and these buildings were also designed with the intention of creating or amalgamating the Maltese balcony within an Art Nouveau architecture. And interestingly enough as well, during my research, I also found the clients that he had, so for whom were these buildings designed for, and in some cases also who were the builders that, that built these buildings. So that is something which gives it a bit of more personal and contextual level to understand who was this person, for whom was he designing, and also to give credit to the builders themselves who executed these architectural buildings. And in these cases, this, this house itself, we see that also within the Maltese balcony, he started to implement Art Nouveau motives, such as the Papel and Cassel motif, which is just a circle um, hung along a vertical plane. And, uh, and this building then gives it this grand aesthetic. Um, also, something which differs Vincenti from other Art Nouveau architects at the time in Malta is his, uh, his unique um, uh, expression to use simple forms, such as a circle or a square motive, which still yet gives the sense of elegance to a building. So even he, did, he didn't need to design or, or sculpt floral motives into an elaborate detail to give it an, uh, an elegant look, but even with true simple forms and shapes, the building still had that elegant appearance to it. Another house in the English street um, also shows this idea of having a Maltese balcony amalgamated with, uh, with the Art Nouveau, Art Nouveau style. And this is also another building which Vincenti had designed in the English street um, uh, with that aesthetic of a Maltese balcony with two uh, wrought iron railings on the side that gives this building this stature of, of, of grandeur and, uh, and uh, importance. So as you can see that the client himself, Dr. Edgar Sofati, was probably a wealthy doctor at the time who wanted to elaborate his, uh, his status within the architecture of the building itself. And we can see that in this case, the building, the front door, so we go back to the other slide, the front door had similar, or close similarities, to another building which was designed in Milan, one found within one of the publications of Vincenti. Right across the road, you see another set of dwellings in, in the English street. So the English street is mainly, most, not mainly, not quarter of the English street, <laughs> or even maybe more, was designed by Vincenti, Vincenti himself. In another case, Vincenti didn't just implement uh, motives or, uh, or uh, 
features from one particular building, but in this case, we see three different houses from three different um, uh, towns and cities in, in Italy, which then resulted into one architectural building designed by him using these components that he had taken from several public from several houses found within these these publications. But Slima, as I said, was main, the main locality where, where Vincentian in general Art Nouveau is found. But there are also other localities where, where Vincenti also designed um, buildings such as um, Birkirkara. And in this case, it's very rare to find an Art Nouveau building within an alley or, or within a, a very the old village part of, of a locality. But in this case, it was a farmhouse which Vincenti extended an additional floor, so the red is the proposed uh, new extension, which then through the wrought iron railing, Vincenti designed this <coughs> elegant townhouse within a corner, a corner alley. So, Vincenti, as I said, wasn't just an architect, but was also an entrepreneur, was a merchant, who also wanted to develop his architectural skills within his own personal buildings. And we start seeing Vincenti's entrepreneurial skills within the building development in the early, in the 1925, so very early in his, in his career, where he purchased eight plots of land. Um, uh, today, this is George Borch Oliver, previously it was uh, Grenfell Street. And, uh, and he built these buildings as for, for uh, rental, which then he then sold for profit in his, in his uh, business. And as I mentioned in the houses of Rudolf Street, um, Vincenti started to experiment not just with the architecture of the building, of the, the ornate um, uh, motives on the facade of a building, but also he played around with several forms. So in this case, even though architecturally they're very plain and very simple, we can note that the balconies themselves, the projection of the balcony, it was something innovative to design a balcony in such a case without stone uh, corbels, the saliatoni, in fact. So, um, in this case, Vincenti had extended the steel beams, roofed over with stone slabs, and created this clean aesthetic of a balcony um, overhung on the, on the pavement. And also had the opportunity with steel, so uh, with uh, steel beams, to have these terraces that overlook um, Spinola Bay in this case. So Vincenti, as we start seeing that these buildings, even personally myself, are starting to see a pattern between, even though I didn't know him personally, I got to kind of know him through his works, through his um, uh, archives as well, and I start seeing a certain pattern of this architect that, uh, that it shows that he was always keen to understand new materials on the market, to exploit them within a local context and also to give an, a new form to the, to the building which was never seen before here locally. Right, just two plots down from the building that I just mentioned, Vincenti then designed his own, his first home summer house. So this is one of his first buildings that he designed for himself, just to live in it. And we can see a huge contrast between those buildings that I just mentioned yet previously and this building itself which is very ornate, which is very um, elaborate and even in the wrought iron railing we start we see that uh, Vincenti gave this sense of grandeur in early in his career and that he wanted to push himself um, further within the local scene, not just as an architect but also as an affluent individual. And the main inspiration of, of the, these elaborate um, uh, motives that we see on the facade were also inspired from uh, an, a building in Milan uh, which was found in these, in these publications. Unfortunately today the building is not in a, doesn't show justice to the, to the original aesthetic of the, of the building but at least part of it I think they are not, you know, not that easy. And in Slima, Vincenti also went into buying land and uh, building them for, uh, for his entrepreneurial um, uh, profits. And we start seeing that 
in this case, in his own personal building, as I just explained, he starts to experiment with new materials and new forms that uh, then he gave himself his own freedom. So, as an architect designing for yourself, you tend to be more, more free, without co client constraints, and uh, his own personal buildings show that sense of freedom and that sense of experimentation. The first set of buildings were designed in 1926 in Dingle Street, Lima, also, and, uh, and here we see a new form of, of the balcony of the Galleria Maltiglia. We see that the balcony here is not in a shape that we are know we, we know of, and uh, and it is amalgamated with the ornate design of the of the building. So the corbels, the stone supports that support the balcony, are protruded down towards the the fenestration, the opening of the of the window. Therefore, it's not just placing the balcony on a facade and it's uh, a motif article, but here even <coughs> deferring from, from other local architects, Vincenti amalgamated the Maltese balcony in its totality within an Art Nouveau aesthetic. And these are a set of buildings in the English street which are, which are still there to today and, uh, and we see that even the choice of certain properties, Vincenti always wanted to see areas that are prominent, so such as a corner plot which he purchased, so once you walking along you see his building um, right there, maybe also as a statement, as, a, as an entrepreneur. Another set of three houses that he designed for himself, so he purchased the land and built, were these houses in uh, Howard Street, corner with Amory Street. And here we see this amalgamation or reinterpretation of the Maltese balcony in a simplistic form, but yet giving it elegance, giving it that imposing elevation. And uh, even though this is a corner site and it's very, so if we had to look at it on plan, we can have a plan of it, but it's a very small plot, but the facade and the elevation gives it this, this grandeur and this uh, ornate aesthetic. And in the same case as the, as the Ding District buildings, these corbels, the stone supports of the balconies, are protruded downwards towards the opening of the door, in this case. So, in another case, in another, this is a very interesting building that we find in Ding District, which Vincenti himself had designed for himself. And, uh, and as you can see in the plan as well, this was disapproved. It wasn't approved by the aesthetics board at the time. So even though Vincenti was to be a very great architect and his permits also weren't approved by the authorities at the time. But, and uh, as we can see, these two are also two case studies which were in the publications found and which shows great resemblance to the, to the architecture that he eventually designed. And in this case, the permit wasn't approved because the aesthetics board as, at the time are saying that the lintel and, and the semicircular windows were an exaggeration of the Liberty style and not in keeping with the architecture which should, follow, which should be followed in the locality. So the aesthetics board at the time wasn't just imposing um, an aesthetic on an individual building, but they were also seeing the context of the whole area and seeing how buildings should be designed so as to harmonize one after the other. Eventually, Vincenti had to change his plan, so he had to abide by the rules and go with a more um, simplistic architecture, which is um, a replica of the first floor, and uh, which was replicated at the, the ground floor. And today, this building is in this state, so the ground floor has had some interventions during the time, but at the main um, elevation of the building is, is intact. And also in this case, we see the stone corbels and the same, the same buildings as I just explained being protruded down to, to, to the door. So, Vincenti didn't design just the buildings, he also designed the balconies themselves, <coughs> the wrought iron railing themselves, and even in this case, you start seeing the shop frontage which was, which was designed by himself. He also designed furniture, which these furniture and um, uh, these photos were taken within Vincenti's house. They were um, uh, part of his everyday furniture. 
and uh, we see that this buckle and chassis motif, you know, that we see in the architecture, in the form of the sculpture, the stonework, is also replicated. As a merchant, he also import had the opportunity or the potential to import fittings himself. So, as an architect, and even internationally, a lot of Art Nouveau architects didn't just design the building, but they went into the design of the interior. And uh, in Malta, locally, Vincenti was one such architect who also imported metal uh, fittings, such as this letterbox, which were embellished within the architecture of the buildings that he designed. So therefore creating a, hom a homogeneous um, aesthetic of, of the building itself. So, as time progressed and Vincenti, all of those buildings that mentioned, I mentioned previously were sold by Vincenti for a certain profit and then he started to see um, bigger projects which he wanted to, uh, to venture on. And, uh, and therefore, we start seeing his landmark building which today are still seen today and, uh, and have his hallmark um, written all over. And in Florian, in this case, we see the development of uh, three blocks which were built um, between the 1929 and 1934. And these, this area in particular in Florian was called the Harper area. Um, in 1924, as I said, there was the Floriana layout comp competition. It was a competition for local architects and international architects to lay out the whole area of Floriana and uh, design areas which were um, thought of to be built and uh, eventually this was not done but, all, but few areas such as these blocks were, were the only areas which were developed and the Phoenicia Hotel as well in Floriana. And this exercise was done because the land was owned by the military at the time so all of the Floriana area was owned by the military and the military had to transfer the property or the land to the government and the government had to choose what to do with this, this land. So one of the main um, ideas was the redevelopment of, uh, of Florian, so building residential development. So the first building that was built was Block C. This was sold by the government, Vincenti purchased it himself and, uh, and he built um, five houses one of them was his own personal house. So Vincenti resided in Lille. He was born in Valletta, but then resided in Floriana. And then in 1929, he built this house, which then he moved in from, um, uh, to, to Floriana. And in this case, the first design proposed by Vincenti was a building which was primarily dominated with the Art Nouveau style, even though maybe from the plan you won't understand exactly the, the ornate features of it, it's very very similar to the ones of the English street in, in Slema, where the corbels, where the facade is, is dominated by these strips that keep on going down to the ground floor. Unfortunately, this building wasn't, wasn't <coughs> accepted by the government at the time, because one of the clauses within the contract that he had purchased the land from was that he had to design within the historical context of Floriana. And Art Nouveau at the time, being a very modern style and a very new style, it wasn't seen to be respectful of the historical context of Floriana. Therefore, Vincenti had to revert back to the drawing board, think again on how to design something which is more harmon harmonious with the historical context of Floriana, which led to a more classical um, architectural building. So certain architectural historians, um, the past, without having access to these archives and uh, this information, used to judge Vincenti on the finished product. So they sound and used to say that this building, is Vincenti was very conservative in the design of, of his house and these these uh, five dwellings. But in reality, it was a constraint put onto him by the government to design in a certain, in this way. And here we see the final product of, uh, of the building. And the main house which Vincenti lived in was 
the house that you see here and number one, Harper Lane Floriana, which was also named after his wife, Maristella. And number two, Harper Lane was named after Hillary. And you can still see the inscriptions within the stonework on top of the front doorway of these houses. And here we start, we also see this imposing uh, architecture that places him, himself, that places Vincenti within this status, within this context of, uh, of presence that architecture gave him. You know, that architecture wasn't just a building, but it also was something that imposes a certain status to the, to the passerby. Internally, Vincenti was then free design how he wanted. So in this case, in number one, Harper Lane, Vincenti then cheated a bit the authorities, let's say that, and internally designed an uh, ornate Art Nouveau um, embellishment within, within his own building. So uh, on the facade, we see a very classical, classical building with, uh, with the Ionic orders and, uh, and several other, other features, but internally, once in Harper Lane, number one Harper Lane, you see this ensemble of uh, entryway that Vincenti implemented in his own, his own personal house. And also an interesting feature that we start seeing about Vincenti is his use of stained glass. And uh, this gives him a bit of more um, features to, to express his architectural, architectural language. Internally, Vincenti then also had this grand staircase, which also was very imposing within uh, his own personal, personal house. Second block, which was also sold by the government, was sold as one whole block, and Vincenti purchased also himself, was known as Block A in, in Floriana. So Vincenti was then saying, you know, if the authorities want me to design in a classical way, then I have to design in a classical way. I had no, no option with that. Because also, in these cases, he was restricted by the government to design within the historical context of Floriano. So, proposals in the Art Nouveau style for Block A, we, we, do, not, we do not find. Because he started with the classical. But some of his proposals were, weren't also accepted by, by the authorities. Because it is of no definite architectural style, and its composition is generally against the rules of architecture and lacks apparent stability and proportion. So, you do one thing and it's wrong, you do another thing and it's wrong. But this is something that, even looking at it from a historical point of view, starts seeing that history repeats itself, and history is also um, made of people like us and authorities like we have that give us certain feedbacks as well. And, uh, and also Vincenti then had to propose certain other developments which then later were, were accepted in his, in his uh, buildings. And also the sense of grandeur that Vincenti always wanted to portray in his personal buildings, we see it in this book A in, in, in Floriana. And in this case, Vincenti sold three quarters of the block and retained a quarter of this block. So as a developer <coughs> himself, he couldn't uh, retain at, the, at first all of the buildings that he was building. So a certain profit had to be made and certain buildings and certain areas had to be sold. But he still retained some, some of the, the apartments that he built for rental purposes. And uh, unfortunately, in this case, during the war, we were bombarded and uh, he had to rebuild it as he did. But overlooking the Grand Harbor of Floriana, these buildings surely gave an imposing um, outlook to, to, to the area and to Vincenti himself. And the third block, which was also purchased by Vincenti, was Block B, which is right next to the other block. So when we see that Vincenti had purchased all of these lands, we see that Vincenti himself defined the extension of Floriana, because Floriana was only till the very edge of, of these buildings, which then these three blocks that I just mentioned were the first extension towards Valletta and uh, giving him the opportunity to, uh, to be um, part of the extension of Floriana. Differently from the other two proposals, the government 
then didn't just impose the idea of you had to design within the historical context. But it, it, in this case, they sub, the government submitted a plan and they enforced the bidder at the time, and it was enforced that he or the bidder had to build in this architecture. And block B, and what differs from the other two blocks was the fact that it was sold in four different plots. So it wasn't just one whole block, it was divided in four areas, and four bidders could have bid for a part of it. But Vincenti had purchased all of four, all of the four of them. And uh, while there was the tender going on, there was some disagreement as well between Vincenti and the government that he wasn't treated well because he bid for all four of them, but he only submitted one application for the four of them. And the government was saying that he just submitted one application, not four. But back and forward, and he was the higher bidder as well for, for all four of them, he had finally then purchased all four of them. And even this note written by Vincenti himself shows that Vincenti was always the highest bidder between the other, other uh, tenders who submitted their proposals. And this is an elevation drawing drawn by Vincenti. As you can see, the difference between the one of the public works and the one submitted by Vincenti is that in the last floor, uh, the public works had drawn up wrought iron railings, but in Vincenti's case, he built um, a timber balcony. And this is the building that there is today. As, a, as I explained, you know, the sense of grandeur is also seen in these, uh, in these apertures. The doorways have been more than three meters long and uh, very imposing in, in architecture. But very traditional as well in terms of style. So in this case, he was constrained by the government to design in that way. Unfortunately, this building was also his during the war. And, uh, and in this case, he retained all of the block. So none of it has been sold. And he retained all of the block and rented the, the apartments and maisonettes to, to third, party, third party people. And uh, therefore, for him, you know, having suffered um, a several, several loss due to the bombardment in the Second World War, it was also a financial constraint on him to rebuild these, uh, these buildings. But in, uh, during the war, Vincenti still lived in Floriana. He still lived in the house, uh, number one, Harper Lane. And, uh, and in this house, he also dug a private shelter for himself, which is still there till today, and uh, resided there until, until the war had, had passed. So living in that house, waking up in the morning, or after the air raid and seeing your own buildings being demolished, I don't think it was a very pleasant experience for him. Another architectural venture was uh, Vincenti buildings in Tashbish. So, in this case, Tashbish was, wasn't constrained by, by any governmental constraints. The land that he purchased was owned by the Baron of Castaferrata Morale Diani in Tashbish, and uh, therefore was very free to design in his own architectural, architectural language. And in this case, we see a set of four houses or villas named after the four evangelists, which um, he built in a new architectural uh, language. Um, although the plan doesn't show the form exactly of the building, we can see it within these photos, where the curves used in, in these buildings and the balcony reinterpreted uh, within the local limestone, and shows that Vincenti started to venture onto a new architectural language. And these houses were, were designed in 1936, uh, and, uh, and Vincenti here started to implement a new material within his architecture, which is the reinforced concrete. Although it is not seen uh, within the building, it is noted closely on site, obviously, but it is found on the lintels of the, of the balcony. Um, which instead of using steel beams, he ventured onto using reinforced concrete. So we're talking about buildings designed pre-war here. And the form of these buildings is very avant-garde at the time. It's very uh, 
simple, but the form of the curves is very um, pleasant to the eye and uh, to the to the passer by as well. At the same time of building these buildings, we not we start seeing a new um, endeavor that Vincenti uh, laid his eyes on. And these are Vincenti buildings in Valletta, just around the corner from here, that Vincenti wanted to, to purchase and, uh, for his own, for his own uh, personal, uh, personal development. So this was the site of the old bakeries. These are photos, original photos taken by Vincenti himself, found within the archives. These are rarely seen images of the old bakeries and designed by the Knights when moving to Malta, so this was when moving to Valletta, this was one of the first buildings built by the Knights in Valletta. You can also note State Street was also narrow as it is still today, as in the narrow part of Vincenti building was widened, but in the original photo we see that the street was completely um, uh, narrow as the other parts of, of Straight Street. And, uh, and in this case, the government had proposed the widening of the street, so the, the widening of Straight Street. As you can note from the plan, the bottom part of, uh, of the area, which is highlighted in yellow, is the area which was to be widened for the widening of the street. So the sale of the bakeries, of the old bakeries, was split into six sites. As you can see, there's, there are six segments, and uh, just like Block B in Floriana, Anyone could have bid for any plot of, of, of the site. But Vincenti was well equipped financially and decided to buy all six sites and build his own landmark building, which is Vincenti building known to you today. In this case, the <laughs> government didn't impose um, the architecture of the building, but gave guidelines. So, the government at the time started to learn exactly how to go by tender on, on the public on public land. And this was the general uh, aesthetics of a building that had to be built within, within the, the site of the old bakeries. So he wasn't constrained to design exactly in this manner, but with a similar aesthetic, which is fair enough for an architect to design in his own um, freedom artistic language. And uh, in this case, Vincenti had submitted several proposals. So the first proposal submitted by Vincenti is very similar to the one of Floriana with timber balconies. And, uh, and in his later proposals, we start seeing that he started to reduce these timber balconies, mainly because he thought that he was going to retain this building and to maintain a timber balcony, it was financially um, a financial constraint. The reason why is that I didn't find exactly why, but as we see um, with the proposals that he submitted, these timber elements within Vincenti buildings were reduced to, uh, to nothing, basically, where there was no, there's no timber balcony, no timber aperture, and, uh, except for the doorways, and, uh, and the final aesthetic of the building is what it is today, which is, which is this. But, the aesthetics board always had something to say. So the core, the very corner, um, so we go back to this slide, we see that the aesthetics board had implemented a certain, uh, a certain design for the building to be more elaborate. We call it the embroil, which is um, engravings within, within the stonework. And this is the final design, which was approved by, by the aesthetics board. But Vincenti Buildings is very interesting, not just as a grand architectural building, but it was one of the first buildings in Malta, if not the first, to have metal windows, metal apertures fitted within. These metal apertures were imported by Vincenti himself, so being a merchant, he also had the opportunity and the contacts to contact suppliers internationally from the UK to bring to Malta metal apertures and uh, some of the flats of Vincenti buildings are still fitted with these original metal apertures almost, um, almost 90, years, 90 years later and these metal apertures Vincenti had to had strictly said they had to be rust proof so in terms of maintenance to maintain this building 
efficiently have put an additional cost within the importation of metal apertures so that he can he knows that eventually when it comes to maintenance these windows didn't have to have much much many and now i just want to show you some of the progress some of the works um, and to understand this colossal structure being built these are the old bakeries being demolished the workers are carving the stone and working within old bakery street there were no cranes at the time so everything had to be pulled with, with a pulley system and, uh, and everything was done by hand the gentle building is about six stories high and uh, it was a very difficult venture for Vincenti to accomplish. The limited time frame that he had was of four years, so in four years he had to build these uh, around 84 apartments and with underlying shops and offices. And in the last photo we also see Vincenti himself supervising the workers who are closing off the bakery. So those curves, those arches that we see at the bottom are the original bakeries of the Knights that are probably still buried within Vincenti buildings themselves. And this is a photo of Vincenti building being complete and fitted with the metal apertures. And the metal apertures themselves were, can be seen as very elegant, very thin in their profile, and it's unfortunate for me, for example, to pass by and see an aluminium at the gentle from this metal aperture. But Unfortunately, during the war, also, the enchanted building suffered a massive in the development. And uh, Vincenti, even through the, there were some funds by the government to rebuild, he, he had this constraint, with uh, some financial constraints to rebuild these buildings. The enchanted buildings was only built about two years, so it was brand new and unfortunately it was um, hit. By, by the bomb. And this is Vincenti building today. This sense of grandeur of aesthetics is noted um, within Vincenti building. And here we also see that uh, he implemented reinforced concrete within the concrete, the, the balusters. So the balconies, the stone balconies, as you can see, the balusters, they're not made of limestone, but they were cast in concrete. So he started to experiment with this new material as we saw in Vincenti buildings Tajbish and where he used it as a structural material but in Vincenti buildings itself he used it as, a, as an ornate feature so reinforced concrete became an aesthetical feature of the building most of the buildings still have the original balusters as well after the war Vincenti then ventured on a new project and um, he ventured on building his own house, a new house for himself in St. Julian's, known as Palazzina Vincenti. This is a photo taken in the heyday of uh, Palazzina Vincenti, Vincenti and his wife sitting on the couch, with, surrounded with very um, antique furniture and uh, that embellished the whole, the whole palazzo. And uh, the, the main uh, influence that he had was in this book that he that he had in his library and what you can see at the very top are papers very small papers that were placed within this book as a bookmark and when i had the book in my hand and i opened the book to see what was bookmarked in this in this book i found several case studies which were very similar in aesthetics to, to palazzina vincenti here, Vincenti starts to see new possibilities in, by using the reinforced concrete, new forms such as the curves, which, um, which gave the building a new form, and, uh, and also some other, public, some other case studies within this book that were bookmarked is, are these two, two dwellings which probably Vincenti liked them because they, they show this small deep balcony. That it was reinterpreted with a reinforced concrete, concrete aesthetics, and it was eventually implemented <laughs> within, within his own house. So Palazzina Vincenti had its main entrance from Main Street, overlooking uh, George Ford Cholovir and overlooking Baluta Bay in uh, in Saint Julian's. And architecturally, reinforced concrete gave Vincenti the freedom of expression 
that uh, no other material could have offered. So in this case, we see the cantilever terrace that, that possibly, it was not possibly done in the past without uh, using uh, column supports at the end. And, uh, and the apertures themselves with a reinforced concrete beam curved around these apertures. So these were architecturally impossible at the time without the use of reinforced concrete. So <coughs> the cost of Palazzina itself was as much as Vincenti buildings itself as well. So all of Vincenti buildings cost around 30,000 pounds at the time and Palazzina Vincenti costed around 31,000. So just to construct his own personal house and he ventured into investing more money into creating a new architectural language. And this is Palazzina Vincenti, still, uh, still intact today. Well, not today, when this photo I took it some years ago. <laughs> Internally, and Vincenti created Palazzina Vincenti with a main entrance, with a main foyer, and uh, to give a more elaborate and more uh, imposing um, entrance to the to the people who visited him at his own house. Palazzina Vincenti was also um, built with two adjacent dwellings, which were two separate houses on the side. One of them was also built for his son, Hilaire. So Hilaire lived on the house on the, on the top right, and the house at the bottom left was rented out to third party. But Vincenti lived, Gustav Vincenti lived in, uh, in the palace, in the main house, in the middle. And there were some architectural developments to design this, uh, this palazzo. And also at the top, at the top right, there's a note which, which says <coughs> that Dragonara's drawing room was about 30 feet by 20 feet. What I didn't mention was Vincenti was a very close friend to the Marquis Chicluna, um, uh, who lived in Dragonara. And he used to visit him several times, uh, Marquis Chicluna. Uh, was a very wealthy banker and very wealthy individual who invested in property and Valuta buildings were, were his as well. And, uh, and it seems that Vincenti was influenced by the drawing room, which was the main sitting area of the Dragonara, to find the, the exact uh, measurements which were implemented in, in Palazzina Vincenti itself. And these are the houses that I mentioned designed on the, on the edges of, of Palazzina. And we see that the reinterpretation of the model of the balcony, as we saw on the Art Nouveau, is reflected into the modernist aesthetic. One main uh, note of, of, uh, of these balconies is that when he imported the metal apertures of these buildings, he made it clear to the supplier that the metal apertures had to be top hung, because what these apertures, what these balconies in Malta have a top hung window and all of these apertures are all top hung. So this shows that his reinterpretation of a modern balcony within a modernist um, aesthetic is very crucial to give context to his architecture. And these are shop drawings of the, of the apertures that he had purchased within Vincenti building, the Palatina Vincenti. Just to go through some photos, we can understand exactly the complexity to construct this, uh, this palazzo, and in this case, the cantilever terrace. You can see the shuttering, or the timber shuttering, which was used to hold the reinforced concrete in place while casting, and uh, which was something new even for the workers themselves. The timber shuttering for the balcony as well, for the reinforced concrete. The curves of the, of the, of the form, which is seemingly sculpted within, within the building line, and, uh, and also the foyer itself, which is made of, um, of a waffle structure, which, is, which are um, concrete beams um, locked into, into each other. And here in this photo, we can see the builders thinking of how to accomplish this art exhibition in reality, because it was something that probably they had never done before in their lives. And internally, this is what Palatina Vincenti looks like, this grand year where the reinforced concrete beams are embellished through, uh, through several plaster um, sculptural motifs and to give it this um, classical aesthetic, but a more richness 
um, aesthetic to the to the building. As you can see, this is one of the the stone that Vincenzo designed and by sculptor um, Joseph Ferria from from Rabat. And also the staircase is also very imposing by Pastino Vincenzo, which was built and reinforced concrete that gave this sense of grandeur within within this building. It was clad with Carrara and Verona marble, red marble, which also gave the building a new aesthetic. And uh, it was something that Vincenzi wanted to, to give to himself and to the people who, who resided um, uh, adjacent, adjacent to him. It also some helped a tunnel leading to, to the Balluta Bay, where he constructed a pier. And um, he used to get a boat, so he had this boat which he used to access from his own personal house below George Porch Oliver Street and uh, onto this, this pontoon, this pier, which was also constructed in reinforced concrete within the bay and uh, giving him this private um, uh, luxury and uh, area where he could, he could bathe or go on the boat or try to see. Some, some final architectural ventures throughout his, uh, his late careers, we see some proposed developments in uh, Bingley Street Slima, which were unrealized, and we see the similar aesthetics of the, timber, of the concrete balcony um, as a reinterpretation of the Maltese balcony. Um, other developments in Graham Street Slima, which also these weren't realized, and also developments in Floriana, where in this case uh, it was built, as you can see, a very similar aesthetic to the houses in Port Oliver, Port Oliver Street. Apap Institute in uh, Santa Venera um, was also designed by Vincenti, and we see this uh, or simplistic <coughs> architecture um, moving towards um, modernism, and also the the cupola of the Church of Saint Publius, which was bombed during the war, was also designed by Vincenti. Um, the dome was completely demolished, and as you can see, it was proposed to have a two-layered dome. And um, presently. There's only the construction of one of the smaller domes because financially um, the parish at the time didn't have funds enough to design the bigger dome, which would have resulted in this grand um, cupola that, that would have dominated the Floriana skyline till, till today. So, as you can see, Vincenti was a very versatile architect. He started from the Art Nouveau and um, Art Nouveau styles. He was very experimental in his approach towards understanding new materials, understanding new forms, new architectural languages, and uh, it is very rare to find an architect such as Vincenti within the architectural stream in, in, in Malta during that time. Um, an architect who wasn't just an architect, but who was an entrepreneur, who was a very well-known individual locally as well, so most of our elders might know who Vincenti is, so Il Peri di Vincenti used to call him, and uh, they, he was a very prominent individual who dominated um, uh, the 20, early 20th century century in Malta. And it was very unfortunate to, to see some proposals that were submitted to demolish or to alter some, some, some of his architectural landmarks, and uh, that's why, you know, by giving these lectures and by publishing the book, I hope that everyone then can, can speak out whenever they see a certain development or a certain proposal which impinges onto not just Vincenti's architectural legacy, but our own architectural legacy here in Malta, which uh, defines us who we are. So, thank you.